morning all. Welcome to this webinar today where we'll be discussing listed property, choosing wisely in the risky market. My name is Valden Teron, Head of Institutional Business at Prudential, and joining me today is Yusuf Molana, Portfolio Manager on Listed Property. He also manages some of our institutional equity mandates. We received a lot of questions from our audience and we do thank you for those. They cover a wide um, array of things, ranging from what are the prospects for listed property, which specific companies are we choosing, etc. I've uh, sought to distill some of those questions uh, and ask them to Yusuf uh, during the course of the webinar today. Um, just in terms of housekeeping, a few things that I do need to mention to you. Firstly, this is a CPD event. To that extent, we will be forwarding the CPD certificates to you in the course of the next week or two. A link to the recording and a copy of the slides will be sent to you in the next day. And then lastly, we do ask you to ask more questions during the course of the webinar. Uh, encourage you to do it as early as possible and not wait to the end. We have a team behind the scenes that will also help us answer some of the questions and Yusuf and I will take the remaining questions uh, at the very end. Thanks and feel welcome. I'll get right into the webinar by posing the questions to Yusuf. Yusuf, welcome to you and thanks for your time. Thanks, Valen. Thank you. It's good to be here and thank you to everyone who's just dialed in today. We really appreciate your time and uh, yeah, look forward to your questions at the end. Yeah, the, the, the audience, they're interested in this bad performing asset for many, many years. They want to know what the prospects are. They want to know which stocks you're picking. But I thought it's maybe appropriate to go back in time a little bit, say over the last 10, 12, even 15 years, and just think about what listed property has done over, over the longer period. It's not always been a bad asset. For many years, it felt like the asset that can't lose. Um, would you care to take us through that journey? Sure. So, so I mean, you mentioned that it, it's been a bad asset for many, many years, but really, you know, before that, it was an exceptional asset class. Um, so, you know, the, the bull market kicked off, uh, you know, in, in 2002. And, and I think what precipitated that was, you know, South Africa came off uh, relatively high interest rates, um, which meant that, you know, with high interest rates, development activity uh, slowed down quite a lot. Um, but interest rates bottomed in the early 2000s, and, and subsequently the African economy grew very, very sharply. So, so what we have was, you know, a situation where there was very little new supply on the market in the early 2000s, um, you know, very strong demand. And, and what happened was that, you know, rents grew exceptionally. So, so you know, those, uh, th th that was sort of quite unique in that it, I think it almost caught the, the, the market off guard. Um, you know, with, with, with the lack of new supply. Um, and then, you know, that brought with it, uh, you know, quite a lot of new office development. Um, and, and unfortunately, you know, towards the latter part of, of that bull market, which ended at the end of 2017, um, you know, the, the economy caught up with, 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 with property and, and, and you had strong development activity meeting sort of weak demand. And, and unfortunately, you know, what you've subsequently seen is, is the effects of, of, of that, um, you know, in terms of negative rent reversions, um, et cetera, and, and, and higher vacancies. Um, but during that period, uh, I think what sort of put the, the, the bull market on steroids was that companies were able to use their, their high valuations to raise equity quite cheaply and buy assets uh, and, and develop assets as well. And, and so that saw, you know, quite a lot of strong earnings growth. But you know, with company valuation shading below where the, where the physical property valuations are, you know, that game uh, could no longer be played. Um, and, and you see that in, in, in this graph. So, you, you know, at the end of 2017, um, you know, the, 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 uh, you know the, the, the market for the best part of a decade and a half had returned 22.5% per annum. And since then, we've seen the market decline by nearly one third every year. Uh, so just under 28% uh, per annum decline, which is, which is, which, which is quite something indeed. Um, th that begs the question, Yusuf, that fall that we've seen, significant fall from the start of 2018, uh, end of 2017. Uh, I mean, we got used to property being somewhere between bonds and equity in terms of expected risk and return. 
what has changed to the asset class from a fundamental perspective, would you say then? So, so I, I think maybe there was a perception of defensiveness, but you know, with, with the bull market came really good predictability of earnings because landlords could have sight over what the vacancies were doing. Um, they knew that you know, tenants were, were going to remain in, 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 in place. Um, the escalations were, were being you know, met. And so like clockwork, you know, one could predict uh, those earnings. And, and you can see in, 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 in this graph, which shows the, the delivered dividend per share uh, in, in, in the, the, the JSAPI, which is the South African Listed Property Index, um, you know, from, let's say, 2006 uh, to 2007, um, you, you know, the, the, the listed property companies were actually able to deliver uh, earnings growth in excess of what the sell side expected. So maybe just to help you read this candlestick graph, um, the, the long lines represent the, the, the top and, and, and bottom estimates of, of the sell side. And then, you know, the, the big shaded blocks, the, the, the second and third quartiles. And you can see in 2006 and 2007, the delivered return, uh, dividends were far in excess of, uh, you know, at the top end of, of, of what expectations were. There was a bit of a wobble in 2008 and, and 2009, but you can see that from 2012 onwards, you know, there was, there was relative certainty over, over that income. But, you know, subsequently in 2017 and, and onwards, um, you know, the companies failed to deliver what, what the south side were expecting. And, and so I think that, uh, you know, probably, you know, disrupted that, 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 that clockwork nature of, of, of the earnings delivery. Um, also, um, I think what one would expect, uh, you, you quite rightly point out that many people thought of the asset class as sitting somewhere between bonds and, and equity and, and expecting a, a return, you know, commensurate with that kind of payoff. Um, but uh, what you've put together is, is just a framework for think, how we think about, um, you know, these property stocks. So, you know, on, on, on you know, some of them have very low le levels of leverage, which, which, which means lower levels of risk. Others have very high uh, levels of leverage, which, which increases your risk. And then similarly for tenant risk, uh, you, you know, one would much rather have, uh, let's say, a grocer, uh, you know, in, in, your, in your property than, let's say, a, a department store retailer. Um, and then I think, you know, property obsolescence risk is, 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 is quite an important um, part of, 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 of the way that we look at property companies. So, you know, what we've seen in, especially in offshore markets is that um, big shopping centers, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a risk of, of obsolescence in that online retail is, is, is taking market share uh, very rapidly now. And, and so, you know, those properties would have a higher risk of obsolescence. And so I think to the extent that you have a property with low risk of obsolescence, such as a, a residential apartment, you know, those would probably be, you know, give you returns much more commensurate with, with, uh, with, with a bond as opposed to an equity. Um, so so I, I think, you know, there is a spectrum of returns and, and, and it differs from, from company to company. One can't really um, say that, you know, the, the sector as a whole is either equity-like or bond-like. You, you know, in, in our market, we have companies that are both corporate uh, bond-like and, 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 and equity-like in nature. So with those changes, Yusuf, uh, the bigger differences between company in terms of earnings estimates and earnings growth, different fundamentals in terms of leverage and so forth. I mean, what has that meant for your property process? So, so I think, Valden, what, what we recognized during, um, you know, the, the market upswing was that these companies were really moving in, in unison with, with each other. Um, and, and you can see that, you know, in, in this particular graph, what we show is the, the, the correlation um, of, of the property stocks to each other, of the SA market as a whole, the, the individual stocks to each other, and also the resources sector. And you can see that, you know, for the most part, property tends to have a higher correlation to each other. So the individual property stocks exhibit a higher correlation to each other than, than the average market. And, you know, so, so during the, the bull market, you know, we see quite elevated levels of um, correlation. Um, but with the bear market, you know, with company performance diverging quite significantly, you know, those, those correlations have definitely come down. And at the end, you'll see, you know, an increase in correlation because, you know, everything fell together. Um, but, but yeah, we, we think the, um, you know, the earnings will, will, will be quite divergent. So, so we've decided to adopt a more active approach in, in, in our multi-asset funds. Um, but also we've, we've launched, um, you know, an active property fund in addition to our um, existing enhanced uh, index tracking fund. 
um, to take advantage of, of this mispricing. Perfect. That's a good journey historically, Yusuf, and also talking about how you had to evolve the process over time, which is quite insightful. If we can move to the pain of COVID-19, obviously it's had massive health effects and we're not underestimating that, but from a financial perspective, the sector lost in the order of 45% to the end of March. It recovered somewhat, but it's still down by quite a lot as we stand at the end of August, um, close to the end of September. I mean, even in a bear market like this, as, as bad as this bear market, there are always some winners and some losers. Can you maybe talk us through which those were? So, so I think, you know, the, the, the losers were, were, you know, I think anyone who's sitting at home and, 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 and thinking about the, the activities during COVID would realize that they've probably gone to the shopping center far less. Uh, they, they may have used uh, uh, online retail for, for groceries for maybe the first time, or they've become a regular user after, after experimenting with it. Um, and you can see from the returns in, 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 in the index that the, the worst returning companies for the year, especially among the, the top stocks, um, of Wukile Property Fund, uh, Redefined Properties, and High Prop uh, Investments. So those particular companies did have, you know, relatively elevated levels of debt uh, before COVID, um, and also, you know, quite a bit of offshore debt. So, so with the RAND depreciating as it has, you know, the, the RAND value of the Euro debt has, has gone up, uh, and also they, they, they are retail heavy, so, so they have quite a lot of exposure to, to, to retail assets, and, and, and so, you know, they, they have been caught in the eye of the storm, and you can see that they've been, been the worst affected. Conversely, on you know, the, 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 the better returning companies, such as Investec Australia a Property Fund and Sirius Real Estate are both offshore players. So Investec Australia, you know, it's obviously in Australia, it has no retail exposure. Um, Sirius Real Estate similarly has, has no retail exposure and as in Germany. Um, and in the rest, you know, for, for, for various reasons are, are down, but to a lesser extent than than, than the worst performers. But, um, you know, there's a clear divergence in, 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 in the earnings um, and, and, and also in, in, in the balance sheet strength of, of these companies. So, so when, when, you know, that's, that's, that's explained by, by, by those factors. So, I mean, the audience alluded to many of those bad uh, factors and, and they're talking about things they can see obviously for themselves, the empty shopping malls, work from home, empty office spaces. And this is even pre-COVID. You know, if you go to places like Santon, Rosebank, a lot of development over the years and, you know, office oversupply. With all the bad news, I mean, I presume there's still caution required in, in certain sectors. So, so I think you're absolutely right, Valden. Um, you know, with office vacancies, um, you know, having increased over the years, GrowthPoint reported recently, and I think their, their office vacancies went up quite a few percentage points. And I think with, with, with vacancies going, you know, quite high, uh, you know, that, that automatically should mean that, that asking rents should decline. Um, and, and you can see there's, there's a very clear relationship. Um, so I'd like to point you to, to the slide on display at the moment. Um, you can see in 2003, vacancy levels in, in, in the office sector, um, you know, reached about 15%. Um, and, and then, you know, the asking rental growth was, was, was pretty much close to zero, and, and that would have been below inflation. And, and, and with vacancy rates coming down fairly significantly in, in, in a South Africa's period of strong growth, um, you can see the, the, the inverse relationship with, with, with asking rental. So, so rents were able to, to grow. So the, the, the number that, that landlords were able to ask for, you know, they were in a fairly good position because vacancies were low. They were able to ask for decent rents. And, you know, that slowly, slowly has, has now um, declined. So, so we think for perhaps an, a number of years, uh, you know, that might be the case. Um, though if there is any good news to come out of all of this is, is that development activity in, in the office sector has slowed very dramatically, such that, um, you know, only about 1% of office stock is currently being developed. And, and, and so, you know, to the extent that that, um, you know, is maintained over a number of years, um, you, you could see, you know, rents at least stabilize in, 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 in three or four years time. But, but until then, you know, I think it will be tough. Um, and I think for large shopping centers, you know, for a number of years, you know, a shopping center was the place to go with your family. Um, and, and, and those super regionals and regionals did very well because families, you know, were able to go there on the weekend and, and dine and, and, and go out to the restaurant and the movies. But 
I think, you know, even before COVID, we were seeing, you know, slowing uh, trading density growth for, for those particular um, sort of retail formats. Um, and, and I think, you know, COVID may, may, may affect that even further. Um, but, but, you know, there, there are, uh, you, you know, other retail, oh, sorry, retail formats which are doing well. So convenience, uh, conversely, has done very well. Um, convenience retail and, and, you know, some niche sectors have, have, have done quite well. But I think we are, we are cautious on, on larger shopping centers and, and the South African office sector in, in particular. If I can maybe just circle back to a, a previous point that you made on, on debt levels in property companies taking on more debt to grow their earnings to buy offshore companies. I mean, there was a specific question about debt levels. Uh, let me ask it to you rather than specifically in general. Um, can you explain leverage, the concept of it, and how it could potentially be a, a bad thing in a down cycle? Sure. So leverage can both enhance returns and, uh, and detract from returns. And, and property is sort of unique in, in, in that, well, uh, it was not unique, but there are other sort of stable sectors where, where one can predict the, the income. And, and so, you know, naturally people then, then take a, uh, a stable asset and, and want to uh, lever to, to get enhanced you know, returns. Um, so, so I, I think, you know, perhaps, you know, below 30% a loan to value ratio. So we, we speak about a loan to value ratio. We're saying the value of the outstanding loans to the bank uh, versus the value of the property. Um, you know, we regard anything below 30% as being very, very safe. Um, between 30 and 40% is probably still, still okay. And then, you know, once you start getting beyond a certain level, perhaps 40 to, to 45 percent, um, you know, it, it becomes, you know, perhaps a bit more, bit more risky. So, so on the graph that, that you see in front of you, we have, you know, just a theoretical property company. So on, on the, using the, the vertical axis for, for equity value um, at a 0 percent loan to value ratio for a theoretical asset of, of 100 rand, um, you know, if you have no debt against that property, your equity value is, is 100. Um, and then just moving down the line, um, you know, if, if you went to the bank and borrowed 30% of, of, of the value of the property, um, you know, your, your bank debt would be 30, your equity value would be 70. Um, and then, you know, there is a linear relationship as, as you move down, but there does come a point where, you know, borrowing beyond a certain point, you know, becomes very risky in that you know, a small increase in, in, your, in your loan to value ratio, which can be precipitated by a, a low valuation, um, would lead you to become a forced seller. And, 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 and we've seen this happen, you know, countless times over the, over the property cycle, um, that companies in trouble are forced to sell assets below their, their fair value. And, and so then you, you, you see that, um, you know, the, the, your equity value declines very substantially because you take an asset that you thought was worth 100 and then end up selling it for 80. Um, and, you, and you find that your, your, your equity value just evaporates um, without doing, uh, you know, anything. And um, I mean, Intu is perhaps a, a good example. So it's a company that we haven't owned in our funds. Um, and, and before the company went into administration, so if it effectively went, uh, you know, declared that it's, that it's bankrupt, um, you know, there was still a positive net asset value to the company yet. It's, it's almost unlikely that shareholders will get much uh, or, or will get, you know, even a fraction of, of that net asset value. So, so I think we are very careful um, on leverage, um, especially given what will be a tough valuation cycle. So, so valuations will most likely go down over the next number of years. Talking about valuations, um, despite the bad news, I mean, there's the old adage that uh, good valuations don't come with good news. They typically come with, with bad news. But uh, looking at valuations, and a lot of people are of the opinion they're attractive. I mean, in many ways, that's the hook to our, to our webinar. We're talking about risky market, but we're also implying there's cheapness in the market. Forward distribution yields are above bond yields, and you know, previous webinars spoke about bond yields being high in their own right. Why do you think the market is simply not biting at this value, or at least nibbling? So, so, so I think, you know, in reality, the, there's no near-term catalyst. There's no silver bullet that will just fix the sector. Um, property does tend to be a lagging sector in that what we see today, you know, in terms of the, the, the tough market today, will only materialize in, in lower rents, maybe in two, three years' time, um, because, you know, leases, you know, we have leases in place for, for, let's say, three or four years, 
And once those expire, um, you know, they'll only expire in, in three or four years at, at the market rent. So, so we still have this, uh, you know, this element of, of over-rentedness in, in the sector. So I think people are just cautious on, on, on what the income can do and also what the, what the loan to value, the, the real loan to value ratios are, because we've only just begun to see the, the decline in valuation. So I think that's, those are perhaps two aspects. Um, property companies are cutting dividends and, and everyone loves a growing dividend rather than a, a shrinking one. So, so you know, that, that uh, you know, is, is another factor weighing on, on the sector. Um, but I think what we, what we do observe, um, you know, is, is that property trades at, at, a, at, a, at a big discount to its replacement cost. Um, and, and, and being a capital intensive sector, to the extent that the properties aren't obsolete, um, you know, we think that's probably a good time to, to, to begin looking at, uh, you know, looking at, at these properties, um, you know, because at some stage, if they need to be replaced, um, you know, you, you have, you're buying properties below what, what it would cost to replace them, and, and that automatically means um, that rents may, may need to go up um, versus the, 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 the replacement cost. Yusuf, I'm going to put you on the spot, um, so fair warning. A popular question, in fact, the most popular question was what your expectations would be for the sector from a return perspective. I know we avoid making forecasts typically as, as prudential, but given the valuations, given the risks, are you willing to take a stab at that? Sure. So, so I, I think with, with many companies cutting their dividends um, to, much, to a level that's much closer to free cash flow, you know, that's arguably you know, quite a good thing. Um, but if we, we, we're sort of observing a, a, a dividend yield one year ahead of, of about 12%, which is, which is quite attractive. It is above the, the 10 year bond yield. Um, and then if you look to you know, the, the forecast of, of earnings growth or, or dividend growth, you know, there, there is quite robust dividend growth because you know, companies are moving from a position where they've cut the dividend to, 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 to the bare bones and, 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 and then hopefully would look to you know, increase the, 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 the payout ratio over, um, over time. Um, but I, I wouldn't pencil in more than, than low single digit growth um, on, on that number. So, so one could look at a, a total return in, in, in the mid teens, um, but, but I, I would be cautious on, on making any near term forecasts. Um, but certainly, you know, the, the, the number that we're seeing one year ahead is, is far closer to free cash flow than, than it has ever been for, 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 for the property sector in, in a number of years. Okay, Yusuf, we won't keep you to a specific number. Okay. Thank you. Although the webinar is being recorded. <laughs> um, let me take you then to where you are possibly more comfortable, and that's company-specific opportunities. Uh, you showed a lot of the companies fell a lot post-COVID because of their unique issues. Um, can you maybe talk in, in some detail about specific companies where you've increased exposure given the, the on-sale signs that, that went up? That went up? Sure. So, you know, I think, I think you know, the, 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 one of the largest REITs in, in South Africa is, is Growth Point uh, Properties. Um, and that's a company that we were underweight going into, into this crash. Um, and, and we've used, you know, this opportunity to buy a bit more. And what's interesting uh, about Growth Point is that they have, you know, some very strong offshore subsidiaries and associates which have their own market value um, and, and don't have exposure to any retail and, and, and trade at, 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 you know, values that we think are, are probably below the private market value of, of the assets. Um, so Growth Point itself trades at, at, at 0.53 times its, its most re recently reported net asset value. Um, but if one removes the, the listed assets from, from, the, from, the, from the share price and also the, the book value, you're paying about 0.32 times for the growth point uh, SA assets. And that includes, uh, you know, a fantastic asset uh, like the waterfront um, and then a diversified portfolio of, of retail and, and, and office properties. And I mean, we're under no illusions that, you know, the, the, the sector will be challenged in South Africa for, for a few years. But... You know, at 0.32 times its net asset value, um, you know, we, 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 given the diversified nature of the portfolio and the fact that the company has largely spent money on its assets over, you know, over a number of years, um, you know, that, 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 that seems quite attractive for, for a very big and, and, and liquid uh, stock. Um, yeah, another company that, that we do like, uh, given the, the, the safety of its, of its income, 
is Equitus. So Equitus is a pure play logistics company, um, which has the longest weighted average lease expiry term in, in, in the South African sector of, of about 10 years. So on this chart, you can see that, you know, the, the you know, Equitus, you know, we show the weighted average lease expiry term of Equitus versus all the other companies in the sector. And, you know, it stands out as, as being way above uh, anything else available, certainly the average. Um, and, and so that, that, that certainty of income we find is, is attractive given that, you know, we think that the income will grow and, and the tenants are relatively strong, um, you know, compared to, 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 to some of the other tenants that, 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 we, that we do see. Um, and then self-storage, so, so there's, there's one self-storage company, a pure play on, um, on, on the JC, it, it's called Storage. Um, but the company doesn't have a very long history. So unfortunately, so what, have, what we've done is um, we've used the, the, the Bloomberg REIT Index, um, which, um, which as you can see, it, it's, it's the black line. Um, so, so, you know, over a period of, of 27 years, um, you know, the, the Bloomberg REIT index has, has, has gone up from, from an index value of starting of 100 to just under 300. But the self-storage index has gone from a value of 100 to, to just under 1,200. So, you, you know, over the long term, there's been substantial outperformance uh, in this asset class. And, uh, you, you know, the, the properties themselves do have a low level of obsolescence, uh, low obsolescence risk. And also, you know, there's very little capex that needs to be spend, uh, spent on, on these properties. So you know, it does make it an above average, uh, you know, asset, asset class. And you can see it, you can see it in the numbers. Um, finally, uh, you know, just, just one company which, which we wrote about in, in, in a recent article, um, RDI REIT, um, you know, one can observe that the, the south side forecast the net asset value to be, you know, 153 pence when they report in, in November. Um, and the share price is, is 95 pence. But what gives us some confidence is that during the pandemic, redefined properties were a holder of about 29% of this company, and they sold it to a, a real estate private equity group called the Starwood uh, Capital Group. Um, and you know, we think that they, you know, are, are, are good property investors and, and 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 sort of understand the assets. And you know, we 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 you're able to buy the assets at, at the same price that they bought it. I mean, these guys are in the business of buying cheap assets, like we are. And you know, we think over time the company should be able to unlock uh, value uh, as, it, as, it, as, as it disposes of its, of its assets. So um, yeah, I, I hope that gives you a decent sense of some of the companies that we like and, and that we've increased our exposure to. Yusuf, sounds like fantastic opportunities. Maybe before we close, I just wanted to pick up on something you mentioned earlier when you compared a property in relation to bonds and equity. And one of the features you mentioned was tenant risk. Is that something you can maybe unpack for us a little bit? Sure. So, so I think it's, it was often underappreciated, you know, when, when, when the market was doing quite well because all tenants were able to pay equally and, you know, there wasn't really a problem where if you had a B or C grade tenant, you know, they were, they were able to pay the rent. Um, but I think what I'd like to highlight, um, you know, just, just looking at, at the slide on, on your screen at the moment, is that there are significant uh, differences between tenants. So, you know, both of these sets of tenants, which we've put together, are available on the South African, uh, you know, in, in the South African market. So, so the first one being Edcon, and, and we know that Edcon earlier this year went into business rescue. It's subsequently been sold for its parts. Um, but at some stage, you know, you know Edcon was, was a big uh, part of the listed property uh, universe's tenants. Massmart, which uh, you know, early on this year, Dion Wired, um, you know, went into into business rescue. Um, the South African government, you know, from from what we can see, is that is that they, um, you know, the landlords exposed to the South African government do struggle to sign new leases. Um, you know, the government is very demanding in terms of the amount of capital expenditure which 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 the landlords need to spend. Um, one one company has, is exposed to Max Steel, which which sells steel products, and and clearly given the the, the downturn in the construction sector, you know that that will be difficult. And then in in the UK, department stores have been you know quite uh, quite poor tenants. So things like John Lewis, Debenhams, um, and New Look, which which uh, which I think South Africans would be familiar with. Um, you know that's that's the one set of tenants that that one could have uh, you know in, in your books. On the other side, you could have defensive uh, tenants like ShopRite, Pick and Pay, 
um, Growth Point Australia as, as the Australian government uh, on, on, on their books as, as a tenant. Um, one could, instead of having Max Steel, you could have the Bidvest Group. Instead of having John Lewis and, and Debenhams, you could have, have, could have Amazon and Tesco in the UK. And then, you know, I would much rather take the risk of, you know, have thousands of, of small self-storage tenants on the basis that only a handful of them, you know, might struggle, but the majority of them would, would be able to continue paying rent and then have, for example, someone like, like New Look in, in, in the portfolio. So uh, I think they very, are very stark differences. One does need to look at the business model of the tenants quite carefully to understand whether they're doing well, because it's, it's quite seldom that the landlord can do well when the tenant's struggling. Um, you know, it, 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 it's probably unlikely to happen. So um, I think, you know, it, it, it is underappreciated and something that we do tend to, to spend a little bit of time on. So in summary, Yusuf, if we can conclude sort of the pre-submitted questions part of, of the webinar, it does sound like there are fantastic opportunities to be had, but you know, there's obviously a lot of risk and you need to do your homework. Any last thoughts that you'd like to leave the audience with? Well, I think, uh, Valvin, you know, what, what we can observe is that um, you know, the notion that property is a defensive asset class has been defeated. You know, it is subject to the, the overall economy. Um, and I think you know, in, 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 in the up cycle, um, you know, people sort of place these earnings on high multiples because they, you know, the perception of, 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 of the defensiveness was, was, was probably um, you know, was not correct. Um, it is a capital intensive asset class. So at the moment, what we're seeing is that the property is traded at a substantial discount to the replacement cost. So to the extent that these properties are not obsolete and, and, and that they, you know, they, they can earn rentals into the future, it's probably a good time to, to be looking at the sector because once things, don't, once, once things normalize, um, you know, one would expect at some stage for, for rents to recover such that uh, you know, a new asset can earn a return on capital. So once you, you, you know, if, if you're buying the assets at a deep uh, replacement cost, at the, beat, at the deep discount replacement cost, um, you know, hopefully over time one, one can see those rentals rise as, as the market becomes tighter. Um, of course, that, that won't happen in the near term, but we try and look about, you know, look further ahead than, than one or two years. Yusuf, thanks for your insights up to now. Uh, we received a lot of questions, and uh, we'll be taking them right now. Thanks, Robin. Yusuf, uh, the first question we got was from Etienne. Uh, you mentioned some of the stocks where you've increased exposure post the COVID sell-off. His specific question is, can you expand a bit from a portfolio management perspective where you overweight and underweight? Sure, happy, happy to do that. Uh, in fact, we prepared a slide because we, we thought we might receive this question. Um, I, I think the slide should be on your screen. Um, and, and I think what, what you can see is that, you know, the largest holding is, is, is Nippy Rock Castle. Um, and and I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you read those, um, you know, as you, uh, you know, as you, you know, as they are on your screen. Um, secondly, Growth Point, which, which is roughly an, an equal weight versus the benchmark. RGI REIT, um, as you can observe from, from the right-hand side, is, is the largest overweight um, in, 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 in the sector. Um, and then that, that's followed by, um, you know, storage property uh, REIT, which, which we've, we've told you we think is quite a long-term outperformer, although it's not necessarily optically cheap versus uh, the other available companies. Um, you know, we do think that the, the level of free cash flow that it provides and the, the likely growth is, is attractive. Um, and then Nepi Rock Castle, which is the largest um, fund in, uh, largest company in absolute terms, um, is also one of the overweights, and, and that's a, a dominant Central and Eastern European uh, shopping center read. And, and, and while shopping center reads are not necessarily in, in fashion at the moment, um, I think we can all observe that online retail has taken, you know, quite a bit of market share in, in, in developed markets. Um, you know, the company doesn't, or in those particular countries, don't suffer from a huge amount of oversupply of retail space. And unlike the Western European counterparts, you know, there isn't really a high street uh, retail component. So, um, you know, when one observes the, um, the, the, the shopping center or retail space per capita, um, you know, that, that's quite a low number versus Western Europe. And while we completely do anticipate online retail taking some share, um, you know, the, the entertainment aspect of, of those malls, it still makes it attractive for, for people to, to want to visit. 
um, equitous property fund, the, um, the, the logistics REIT that, that we're invested in, uh, as mentioned earlier, we like the long weighted average lease period. So the average uh, unexpired lease term is about 10 years and, and we like the security that that, that, that gives to us. Um, and then lastly, SA Corporate Real Estate Fund is a diversified fund, but the, the office exposure is only about 5% of the total portfolio and, and the majority is residential, which we think um, well, it's currently going through a bit of a difficult period, um, but you know we think those rents adjust to market quite quickly. So the the, the, the rents that you observe are, are are roughly market rents, and then the industrial uh, you know has, has very low vacancies. I think post this recent disposal, um, the recent disposals that they've that they've completed, you know vacancies will be under one percent. So you know that suggests that you know it's quite a, a decent portfolio in terms of you know attractiveness to its tenants. And then the, the retail is mostly geared to, um, to convenience, uh, and we think that will be a better place to be than, um, than, than larger shopping centers. Thanks, Yusuf. Uh, you made mention earlier in the presentation, and someone picked up on it, the new Prudential Property Fund. You've been running the enhanced uh, proper, uh, the, the tracker fund for a number of years, and the question essentially is how this new fund uh, compares to the existing fund. Thank, thanks, Dalvin. So I think we launched this fund because we, we saw that property, you know, we were seeing increased levels of, of mispricing or at least certainly divergent fundamentals. And we, we hope to be able to take advantage of that. And um, I, I think, you know, we, we've prepared also an, an, another slide just to show you the, the difference between, uh, you know, the, 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 two, the, the, the two property offerings. Um, so in, in the first instance, the enhanced property index you know, it takes very, very limited bets versus the, the benchmark. And the idea is just to provide uh, our investors with the beta of the market and, and give them the index returns uh, after fees. Um, so, so we think, uh, I think the slide should be in front of you now. Um, you, you know, just, you know, we, we try and, 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 and be neutral on, 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 on sectors, on geographies, and also, uh, you know, try to, you know, target the companies with a bit lower leverage than, than high leverage. And over time, you know, that, 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 that has added, uh, you know, some value to clients. But, you know, more recently, you know, our, our views are that, that, that the one can make money from, from stock picking. And then we look to take more active risk um, in, in, in the Prudential Property Fund. Okay, maybe some specifics. Um, please educate me as well on, on where to ask the question about REIT status and uh, the talk about the changes to, to read status. Right, so, so uh, I, I mean, I, I think those of you familiar with, uh, with South African REITs know that to maintain your SA read status, one needs to, the companies need to pay out about 75% of their accounting earnings. Now with the, with the, the stress of, of, of COVID, you know, a lot of companies have, have elected instead to withhold dividends to strengthen their balance sheets. Um, but there is the risk that if they're not able to meet their distribution requirements that they, that, and, and pay out 75% of their earnings, that they fall out of that REIT status. Um, and, and, and I think what, what the companies are waiting for is for the FSCA um, to, to, uh, uh, the, and the JSE to provide them with some um, relief in terms of being able to pay out slightly less than the 75% and maintain the REIT status. Um, there isn't yet clarity on that, um, but, but uh, yeah, I think that will be forthcoming in, in the next couple of months, but yeah, just, just no clarity as yet, Melvin. Sure, there's a question. Do you think property managers will be re-engineering their office spaces? Are they giving some thought to either downsizing or other alternative strategies? So in terms of re-engineering the, the property sp uh, spaces, we haven't yet seen that. I, I think you know, companies will probably wait to see how COVID plays out if it becomes endemic. So, you know, if it becomes almost like a, like a normal flu season, then, then one might need to, um, you know, implement social distancing and, and, and barriers in offices. And, and we have seen some of that, um, you know, offshore, but not necessarily in, in South Africa. Um, so so not, not yet, but, but uh, I think we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Your view on the platinum? Um, the question is in relation to people being able to work from anywhere, <laughs> okay. in theory from the platinum as well. Um, so any thoughts on that? So, so I, I don't think, uh, I mean, I think it, it could work, but I think those of us who have worked from home, um, you know, we're able to, we have the rapport with our colleagues because we've spent some time with them in the office. And, yes. and, and I think that's 
that's quite critical, uh, you know, to build company culture. And, and I don't think one can easily replace that. Um, you know, one could envisage a, a scenario where people work from home two or three days a week um, as, as to whether, um, you know, one can work on, on, on a farm in the Platteland. You know, I think you'll have a very good employer if you can manage that. <laughs> yeah, um, this is a question that just came through. Why would the SA government not be considered uh, a defensive tenant? So, so, so I, I, I think we have to distinguish between the SA government a, a, as a, a, you know, a guarantor of your SA bond, uh, the SA bonds that you're invested in and, and them as a, as a tenant. Um, so I think if you, if you speak to the landlords who do have the government in their, in, in their, in their, in their portfolio, um, you know, they have struggled to sign leases on a long-term basis for the government because of, um, you know, the, the, the staff changes and, and the regulations uh, required by the um, Department of Public Works. Um, so that's quite difficult. And then, you know, often the, the, the capital expenditure that, that's required, you know, for government to sign a long-term lease, it, it's quite onerous um, to the point where, you know, landlords may question whether it's worth spending such a, a sum of money just in return for a three-year lease. Um, you know, because I think what most companies would look for is to spend money and, and in return obtain a, you know, a much longer term lease. Um, and then in, in many of the nodes where government do occupy, you know, they, um, you know, and, uh, to the extent that they, that they are, you know, they can move, you know, I think they, they, they might do that. Um, so, so, so I think what we observe is that, you know, banks are, are reluctant to fund um, government buildings on a long-term basis because the, 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 the nature of the leases is quite short-term in nature. Yeah, uh, this one arguably puts you on the spot, Yusuf. This is the salesman asking the portfolio manager. Uh, the, the question is quite pointed from someone. Uh, why listed property? Why Prudential in particular? Right, so, so I think, you know, at Prudential, we do follow, uh, you know, a prudent valuation-driven uh, approach. Um, you know, it is the approach that, that has led to our clients outperforming over the longer term. And, you know, we'd like to be able to apply that same approach to listed property. And, and we kind of look to get into the details, looking at the cash flows, looking at the tenant risks, looking at the property risks. And, uh, you know, before COVID, we, were, we, we did undertake, you know, extensive site visits to kick the tires and, and, and make sure that, that we're able to um, you know, do proper research such that we can do a good job for our clients. Um, so, so we are very committed and, you know, we would be very, um, you know, we'd be very appreciative if, if uh, you know, our clients continue their, their support for our listed property portfolios and, and our other portfolios. Excellent, Yusuf. I'm going to leave it there. I mean, it's Friday morning after all, approaching 12 o'clock and at least Cape Townians are quite eager to get out. I'm not sure about people in the rest of the country. Um, Yusuf, I want to thank you for your time in preparing for this. It was really insightful. The audience seems to concur. To the audience, thank you so much for your attention. We know the webinar space is quite contested, all these fireside chats and webinars. So we've had over 400 people dialing in today, uh, a little bit more that registered. We thank you for the support. It's, it's really, really valued. A link to the recording, as I said, will be sent early next week, as well as a copy of the slides. We want all of you to continue supporting us, so be on the lookout for the next webinar somewhere early in October. Have a fantastic weekend, everyone.